Good, uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good morning from my side. Uh, my name is Beatrice Poda. I am the head of unit of uh, the unit uh, of energy and renewable energy financing mechanism in the European Climate uh, Infrastructure and Environment Executive Agency, CINEA. Uh, together with my colleagues in CINEA and from uh, European Commission Director General for Energy, I'm very pleased to, to start, let's say, with a short introduction, this uh, information session on the first uh, um, Connecting Europe Facility Energy Call dedicated to studies and works for uh, cross-border renewable energy projects. Uh, following the publication of uh, the call on the 8th of November, putting an indicative amount of 30 million euro for studies uh, and, and works. Um, this call also follows the publication on uh, the um, list of cross-border projects uh, in the official journal this, this week. Uh, before maybe we go into, into, you know, we dig into the, the details of the program for today, I'd like to give a little bit of introduction about uh, CINEA, so our executive agency. Um, and it's, uh, let's say, how it contributes to, to the European Green Deal policies of the Commission. Uh, CINE is an executive agency that was established in 2021, building on uh, uh, the programs that were managed by two uh, ex-executive agencies, INEA and ASMED. And uh, from 2021, um, CINEA is, uh, by managing, let's say, a larger portfolio of uh, programs, um, has a bit, let's say, the ambition and to play a crucial role uh, as a sort of EU focal point for uh, funding and implementing programs dedicated to, to green projects and to infrastructure projects, and therefore, in that sense, contributing from the implementation of programs point of view to the European Green Deal's objective. Uh, we see that CINEA manages uh, uh, programs such as uh, um, the Horizon Europe, in particular the Climate, Energy and Mobility Cluster, the Innovation Fund Program, the European Maritime and Fisheries Aquaculture Fund, the Renewable Energy Financing Mechanism, the Just Transition Mechanism on the Public Sector Loan Facility Pillar, and last but not least, and that's the focus of today, the Connected Europe Facility, uh, two uh, with the sectors of transport and energy. The overall budget of uh, that CINEA um, manages until 2027 is uh, 55, 55 billion, so it's a huge budget, and we are around 500, uh, 500 staff. Uh, now, uh, concerning really a bit the topic of, uh, of today, Let's dig into the program of connecting your facility energy and in particular the window of cross border renewable energy projects. Uh, traditionally, or since 2014, SEF Energy has uh, funding uh, as aimed to, let's say, to transform European energy infrastructure into more resilient, greener digital uh, networks. And uh, the traditional sector of uh, um, CEF Energy has been the, the, let's say, infrastructure projects within the context uh, or the policy context of the Trans-European Network Regulation. Uh, so therefore really supporting, let's say, infrastructure energy projects with a cross-border dimension. Um, but um, as I already mentioned, since uh, uh, in the period 2021-2027, we have a new category of eligible projects uh, under CEF Energy, which uh, is defined as the cross-border projects in the field of renewable energy. Um, this new category was, uh, let's say, set up with the objective to contribute to the joint planning, development and cost-effective exploitation of renewables. Um, and in, but in particular, let me say, uh, to contribute to um, strategic uptake of renewable energy projects and renewable energy technologies overall, but with a specific focus to promote cooperation between member states and between member states and third countries by supporting uh, the, um, let's say, the objectives of the European Energy, uh, of the Renewable Energy Directive 
um, and in particular, let's say the the, the aspect of cross border uh, cooperation and cross border projects. Um, you probably know this already very well because uh, we are speaking here to an audience of, let's say, projects who already, let's say, went through um, some parts, let's say, of um, of the application processes uh, established in this uh, in this window. Um, you went already, let's say, in uh, um, getting, let's say, what we call the status prof the status process, and um, there, let's say, there was a first uh, a first call for that last year, and uh, we expect to launch a new a new process for application uh, early 2023. Um, following, let's say, the status uh, following, let's say, the selection procedure under the status pro projects program or projects, uh, we have opened therefore uh, the call for works studies that is open now. And that is open only for projects uh, that are eligible, that became eligible following the selection process and are now established under the under the, uh, the CBRS list. We should not forget that in parallel to this process, there is uh, also um, what we call a call for preparatory studies. So SEF Energy supports um, the, let's say, studies for the preparatory phase of projects. Uh, who aim to uh, be in the future established uh, have to have the link the, the status of cross border res. So they it's really supporting at the stage of pre feasibility studies. Um, we published uh, we we had a call last year which uh, went into let's say selection of two of two applications, and now we have a, a call for preparatory studies open. Um, until 10th of January 2023, with an indicative um, budget of 1 million euro for these pre feasibility studies or preparatory studies. Uh, this um, uh, closes, let's say, this, uh, this part on CBRS project. Perhaps I should uh, also say that um, uh, overall, let's say, until the end of 2027, out of 5.8 billion euro, um, there is an indicative budget set aside for the cross-border renewable energy sector of 875 million euro, subject, let's say, to possible further revision and depending on market, market uptake. Now, after this introduction, uh, let's focus a bit on what we have on the, the agenda for, uh, for, you, for you today. Uh, so we will have, uh, let's say, an introduction by, by Vasil Stoinov, legal officer, in and policy officers in uh, DG Energy at the European Commission on um, will explain a bit better than my introduction go a bit deeper into the policy context of cross-border renewable energy projects and let's say with focus messages to uh, let's say to you as participants representatives of our first list of CBRS projects and after that, we'll go really into the details of the call for proposal, starting from, uh, let's say, the evaluation process and our criteria. And that will make it, let's say, also close, let's say, the first part of the program. And then we'll go really into very practical uh, sessions where we will give, um, hope, let's say, a lot of tips for you on how to prepare a successful proposal um, and then we'll go through really how to get familiar with budget management in proposals and application. And then there will also be a demo uh, regarding, let's say, proposal submission. We will finish with uh, um, an introduction also to the legal framework and in particular the model grant agreement uh, for, uh, for SEF. So once you are selected, let's say, what is expected, let's say, from from uh, to become, let's say, really a beneficiary? What is the contract that um, US beneficiary will have to, let's say, sign with with CINEA? The second part will be ex ex exclusively dealt by my colleagues uh, um, Camilla, Gianluca, Cristina, and uh, and Nadine in uh, in in CINEA. Uh, in both sessions, we aim to have a Q and A. So we have also a slide on. Uh, we will be questions in the chat, in the chat. So not no slide, but questions in the chat. So uh, use, let's say, the chat to put questions. Also, let's say, as soon as you see uh, that you want to put a question, please 
please just do it in the chat and we will collect them and uh, we will deal with it in the q a and possibly even let's say around uh, around 10 o'clock if there are questions for uh, for 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 the commission in terms of uh, and there will be also a second q a session at the end of the second part um in terms of our housekeeping rules uh please keep your video and mic off during the presentation um raise your hand for question but again really write in the chat it's uh, probably better um and write them as as it goes and uh there will be also possibility really to you know if you raise your hand to that we give you the floor so at that moment uh, state your name organization and the uh, cbs project and uh yeah also feel free to use emoji if something is not clear or or, or clear or, well so this um i hope let's say that's uh let's say sufficient uh, clear enough for everybody so without further uh, ado i would like to give the floor now to to vasil stoinov to to start the introduction on the on the policy context in relation also to this call for calls. Yes. Thank you for your attention so far, and uh, we hope, uh, let's say, it will be an interesting program and quite informative uh, for uh, for you. Vasil, the floor is yours. Thank you, Beatrice. Good morning, colleagues. Welcome to this info day. My name is Vasil Stoinov, and I work in the renewable renewables unit in the Director General for Energy at the European Commission, and I'm responsible for the implementation of the Connecting Europe facility window for cross-border projects. In my short presentation, I would like to first update you on what has been developing at EU level since you have applied uh, for the status of cross-border renewable energy projects. And I must say quite a lot of developments happened. Already in May, a couple of days after the deadline for application uh, for status under the cross-border renewable energy window, the Commission has published a very substantial action plan to, substi to substantiate the Repower EU initiative. So this plan was published on the 18th of May and among others included a revision of the Renewable Energy Directive on top of the revision by, uh, proposed by the Commission already in 2021, which is not yet in force. So this new revision from May increases the EU target for renewable energy by 2030 to 45% and uh, puts forward a framework to streamline the permitting procedures, which have been uh, identified as a major bottleneck for the deployment of additional capacities of renewables. So for, for your projects, this, um, this specific policy development is quite, uh, quite crucial as it shows the prominent role of the renewables in the framework until 2030. So the ambition is increased even further. This calls for making absolutely full use of the available potential at EU level, which in turn makes the cooperation between member states even more important. Another thing that happened was uh, a series of emergency regulations based on, on uh, this provision in uh, Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, 122, so those are fast-track uh, regulations which are adopted only by the Council. One was adopted in September, targeting the high electricity prices by reducing the demand and capturing the inframarginal prices by renewable energy producers and other uh, low carbon um, renewable uh, low carbon producers so the cap is at 180 euros per megawatt hour and everything beyond the cap uh, is collected by the member state in order to be used by uh, in order to be used to support and offset the high electricity prices so this regulation has been uh, adopted another proposal from october was uh, published by the Commission in order to better coordinate the joint gas purchases and to put forward measures to further uh, reduce the uh, high volatility of uh, energy prices. Another proposal also reason, uh, very relevant to renewables was published uh, just uh, 10 days ago uh, in November to in order to accelerate the deployment of renewable energy sources through mandatory uh, shortening of deadlines of permitting procedures. So overall, um, these measures show that renewables are at the core of Repower EU. Renewables are seen as a major instrument to offset the dependency on fossil fuels and uh, 
the role of renewables in achieving those objectives, getting uh, to energy independency and at the same time boosting decarbonization has, is stronger than ever. What might be also relevant for you as project promoters is the ongoing negotiations on the proposals for a revision of the Renewable Energy Directive from 2021, where in Article 9 in the Directive, the Commission has proposed a mandatory obligation to the member states to conclude cooperation agreement and to carry out a joint project by 2025. So, uh, of course, I cannot reveal the, the details of the ongoing negotiations, but uh, we can safely say that in one form or another, this, this provision will uh, survive to the final uh, compromise and uh, will effectively impose higher thresholds and higher obligations for member states to carry out cooperation agreements, which are also the basis for, uh, for your projects. So I think all those uh, developments are quite relevant for you and really show the importance of projects like yours and uh, the increasing uh, strategical role of those projects in the coming years. Now, in terms of key policy aspects to be reflected, something very, very practical and very crucial uh, for you, which uh, has raised already a couple uh, of questions also in the past, but uh, for the current call even more importantly, and uh, this is about the focus of the call. So, as we have always ha highlighted, the reason and the purpose of the cross-border renewable energy projects is to promote the generation of renewable energy and the increase of renewable energy capacity. Of course, the CEF uh, regulation acknowledges another policy priorities like um, integration in the market, uh, grid reinforcements, digitalization, uh, decarbonization, reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. But for us, as policy objective, renewables will still be at the heart of this call. So this raises the question, what happens with projects which have hybrid nature and which involve not only renewable generation, but also other additional components? The approach that we are considering to take in this call and which we will apply is to give priority to the renewables component. So those components of the projects which directly contribute to new additional renewable energy capacity and production of renewable energies. How are we going to implement this approach? It's going to be implemented at two levels. The first is the level of studies. So if project promoters apply for studies, <clears throat> no prioritization will apply. So we will use a project as a whole approach, meaning that if a study covers renewables and non-renewables components, there will be no differentiation. So the reason behind uh, this uh, approach is that at the level of the studies, it makes sense that the study addresses the project uh, in its integrity, the whole project setup, and such an artificial division between renewables and non-renewables parts at the level of studies and at the level of uh, feasibility or um, cooperation agreement, cost-benefit analysis, or any other type of analysis is uh, rather suboptimal. So at the level of the studies, no uh, differentiation between renewables and non-renewables components. At the level of works, however, we're going to apply such a differentiation whereby projects which apply with requests for grants for construction for the renewables components of their project will have higher priority. This means they will be uh, ranked first until the budget is depleted. If there is leftover from the budget and the projects applying for works for the renewables components don't capture uh, the whole amount of the budget, and there are additional requests for funding for works of non-renewables components, we will uh, also award those projects at the, at the second uh, stage, as long as those projects comply with the requirements of the CEF regulation in Article 7, Paragraph 4, and uh, more importantly, with the requirements of Article 3 of the delegated regulation. Uh, you remember well that this article allows for non renewables components to be part of the status, as long as three criteria are met, that those projects are integral 
those those components are integral part of the project. They are ancillary and uh, they enable the more effective integration of renewables. So we are going to leave to the project promoters to justify how those uh, elements are met. Again, we're not applying any qualitative approach, uh, so quantitative approach, so there are no thresholds, uh, no percentages, uh, things like that, but it's more, more of a functional assessment. But uh, important important part is that those projects will still be eligible for funding as long as there is leftovers from the projects which are applying with um, the renewables components. And a third important point in this in this approach is that we're willing to avoid overlaps between the 10E and uh, CEF uh, PCI funding, meaning that the 10E, 10E regulation and the PCI status is given to projects which involve uh, interconnection. So if a cross-border renewable project also has interconnection components, which in principle fall into the scope of the 10 e regulation, uh, those components of the project should not uh, be funded by the CEF res window because there is a dedicated other window for infrastructure, which is, uh, which is focusing on those components. And we uh, would like to keep the the two types of infrastructure separate in order to uh, to avoid double funding and avoid confusion and avoid also overlaps in the policy scope. That's uh, <clears throat> that's in short the points that I wanted to to make. Uh, there will be a um, uh, window for for questions after the next presentation. So I put a stop here and uh, pass the floor to Gianluca. But thank you very much for the attention. Thank you very much, Vasil. So uh, I invite you again to raise your question via chat uh, also in this uh, first part on the, on the policy side, knowing that uh, Vasil from the Commission will be here uh, for the next uh, 20 minutes. So if you have questions on the chat, uh, just, just write it down and I will stop at certain point to my presentation to give enough time to, to reply more on the policy. Uh, type of uh, of questions, so don't don't hesitate. Um, I will uh, drive you through the um, evaluation process, and the uh, and then Beatrice will take uh, over on the award criteria. So you will have a view of what's what, what will happen in the in the say in the whole whole process of uh, from the start of this call, which was. Uh, uh, published on the 8th of uh, November, so called publication. You have you have access to the. Uh, call document uh, uh, there today we have the info day uh, you have seen the indicative budget of the call so it's it's 30 million and uh, i'm sure you are aware of the deadline so uh, again uh, 23rd of february uh, at uh, 5 p.m uh, brussels uh, time then the evaluation uh, will kick off and uh, will lead to the selection and then uh, to the to the grant uh, preparation period the whole this these blocks will uh, take between february and uh, june the evaluation will be between february and march uh, then after the evaluation then i'll, I'll explain later um, more into detail um, there is the CEF uh, committee coordination uh, so the consultation of the CEF committee and uh, and then after some internal process i will i will explain we will go through the launch of the grant preparation so we can see in uh, uh, in the next slide the uh, evaluation process itself uh, and uh, uh, the main components uh, uh, are, are are there so the first part when we receive so after the uh, 23rd uh, of uh, february uh, so after that the deadline we will go straight through the so-called preliminary checks and uh, these are namely the admissibility check and the eligibility check um, mainly making sure that the application is complete and is not missing any any mandatory document and then uh, checking the the minimum uh, requirement are met i'll explain later uh, then the evaluation itself will be done uh, through individual assessments and uh, there will be uh, then uh, a, a global evaluation and then um, it will go through an internal co uh, committee uh, of the commission that will decide, will take the decision and propose the draft list. So you see the actor on the bottom side, Sinea, evaluation and commission, uh, they all interplay in this uh, phase. Um, 
And then for the selection process, uh, once the draft decision is, is taken, there are a series of internal steps. Uh, so inter-service consultation, for example, in the commission. So consulting the various uh, various directorates on that, on the decision, then consulting the CEF committee uh, uh, as well, and informing the European Parliament, and then there will be the adoption of the of the decision and the information to to the applicants. So more into the admissibility and eligibility, we can uh, see what it is about. So the admissibility is really making sure that uh, uh, so everything is submitted by the deadline via the portal. Uh, so only via the portal, no paper submission or other other means or emails or, or things like that. So it's really on the portal, and then we check whether it is completed. So you have uh, you have seen in the call we will go through today series of uh, documents that are mandatory. So this will have to be part of the package and others that are optional and it depends on your case. Uh, other condition of course the application must be readable, accessible, printable, this typical uh, basic form condition and maximum 120 pages and anything beyond will be considered by the evaluators. Uh, the eligibility, so obviously you, we are looking for projects, as Vasilio was saying, so uh, contributing to the CD, CDRS uh, projects, so the three that are in the list and uh, and um, uh, the delegated act for, of the list uh, is actually entering to force today uh, as we do the info day. Um, so, and then you have the two blocks, so the two topics, the studies and works. Uh, the both are defined in the article two of self-regulation and you'll find extensive uh, uh, examples of studies and works also in the call document. So studies, uh, uh, it's really uh, can be, Many type of studies around the preparation, mapping, feasibility, on-site studies, uh, uh, testing, uh, and validation studies. So quite, quite, uh, quite comprehensive and works. Yeah, it's fairly intuitive. So it's more related to the, to the construction part, really. Don't forget, it's really important. Uh, it's a specificity of the CBS. Your your action that you will submit for self funding. It's a, a part of the a piece of the puzzle. The wider puzzle is the CBS project that you have uh, submitted uh, earlier this year and uh, you have received a status for. So uh, the, the, the action should contribute clearly to the to the uh, to the CBS project, be coherent and try to make it explicit whenever there is there is a clear contribution on what you propose uh, to the CBS project. So what could be the scope of an action in general? Vasil was saying both aspects or so the rest uh, generation uh, component obviously is the main focus of the of the of the program, but also non-res component. Uh, uh, we know uh, not uh, not not uh, uh, specific conditions uh, other than those uh, um, that are uh, related that are detailed in the in the delegated act article 3 in particular and of course project can have also both uh, components in 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 the mix but still talked about uh, the the focus for the works uh, so i want i won't repeat myself on on that Examples, uh, you, you will find that in the first part of the call document, uh, page uh, 7, 8, 9, uh, that area, so feasibility studies to collect the data, technical uh, studies, environmental impact assessment, uh, on-site studies to, to really uh, see whether the, the, the foreseen uh, area for your, for your project is, is uh, feasible front-end engineering and design studies. So this type of studies is just an example. And the longer list in the, is in the cold text and it's also non-exhaustive there. So, uh, but to give you some idea. We can see also works. Uh, uh, again, the other, this, this three main parts of the construction assembly installation of the rest components, really the generation. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a key aspect of the program. There can be aspect of related to the transmission facility necessary to connect the REST component and a storage and conversion facility as well. Uh, again, uh, important to comply with, uh, with the condition, the free condition of the delegated data and self regulation, specifically in these two bullet points. Yeah. So the eligibility, um, it's more focusing on the on the participants, so to say, and uh, ensuring that the participants or the beneficiary that will be part on your proposal 
uh, have the minimal conditions. So legal entities basically should be legal entities, public or private, and established in one of the EU member states. Uh, so it's possible for non-EU member state in case there are negotiation to enter in SAF, but uh, for the moment, as today, as today, no countries other than EU member states. So it should be fairly straightforward. Um, then uh, there will be a check on the operational capacity on the on again on the beneficiary. So uh, to ensure that you have the know-how and uh, qualification, but also the resources then uh, to implement the project you are proposing. How do we check it? Well, through what you include as information in the in the application form, notably in the implementation plan, but also through the activity report um, that you will have to submit. Uh, um, Unless, uh, unless you are public body member state organization, TSO, international organization. In this case, you are exempted to submit uh, activity report, but more on that later. So this is a check on your capacity to do this, uh, the things that you propose in your project. And the same in the same vein is to check the financial capacity uh, so that you have uh, enough financial resources to be able to implement the project. And this will be done uh, for beneficiary that are part in the selected uh, project on the reserve list. Uh, again, this is done normally on, on all beneficiary with the exception I mentioned uh, before for the operational capacity. So public bodies on the state, international organization, TSO are exempted or in case you request an amount of grant that is lower than 50, 60,000 uh, euro. And before going to the award criteria, uh, I'm just uh, checking whether there are questions in the chat or you want to raise questions, uh, any hands up on in the first part, on the policy part, uh, notably, as well as Sylvia will be with us uh, for a few more minutes, uh, or also on the part I've just presented. Uh, anything, uh, do you see anything, uh, Camilla, so far? No? Uh, there's one. Ah, this one. Okay, where the question is, oh wait, sorry, I can't see what, what little screen. Uh, yeah, so what kind of component fall under the definition of res uh, generation and where is the split between res component and non res component? I, I can take it or do you want to take it, Basil, as, as you prefer? Yeah. Sorry, this differentiation between renewables and non-renewables component is relevant only for the application for works. So for works, is uh, this this is quite straightforward. So if the costs as part of the proposal are related to capex investments in new renewable energy generation and the construction of renewable facility which produces renewable energy in under one of the technologies. Uh, listed in the Renewable Energy Directive, then it is renewable component, so rest generation component. Everything which is not related to the uh, capex of installation of new renewable energy generation capacity is non-renewables component. So at the level of the works, the differentiation is indeed uh, the, uh, the qualification of the costs, whether or not they're related to the capex of a renewables project. But for studies, again, Yeah, luckily that we are uh, next to each other, mm -hmm. sitting in the same room, so that my battery died and I can simply take the, uh, the laptop from the colleague. So, yeah, that basically that was the reply of my question. Just to make sure that for studies, no differentiation, no split between the components is uh, carried out. And Luca, something to add? So, okay, for me, uh, I'm just uh, turning to Nicole, whether it's fine for you, any also, I don't thumbs up if it's fine or just chat in the in the chat. Or do anything to add? Or raise your hand if you want some complementing information. Yeah, okay, fine. I see thumbs up. Uh, I see another question in the chat. In case of a project with larger value chain, different type of assets, can individual part of the value chain apply separately for for studies? So, uh, okay. 
Yeah, this. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we will we also go into that uh, detail uh, on the successful uh, proposals, but uh, uh, I mean, in general, uh, when you have a longest time span and you have many assets, uh, uh, it's, it's understandable that you are ready with, with a part of it, but it depends on, uh, on probably your case by case. So uh, the, the bigger picture we see, the better, so we can see the whole chain. Uh, but uh, then it depends on the maturity of which part of uh, of, uh, of the chain is mature, so to say. So um, there's no yes or no. It's more it's more to see what the individual cases, of course. So the, the better we the, the the more complete picture we see, this, the better it is. But you have to see what is actually ready for for this call. Uh, so of course, if you come with a, a part. That's also fine. It's, it's not you're not excluded by that. Then we have to see the evaluation, of course. You want to add anything? Um, that... Yeah. So on the on on the award criteria, uh, touch upon award as well. So, but okay, this is the first uh, uh, question. Anything else on the policy part so far? Can see. For the moment, okay, but fine for you, okay. And no raise hand, I don't see any raise hands. Uh, yeah, okay, I see a question from a uh, girl, it's on the starting. This, I, I'll come back to that uh, on, the, on the later presentation, we'll answer to, to that one. So, uh, no problem, we'll go into, uh, yeah, uh, then Camila, you have your part there. So we'll come back to that. See any other raised hand? No further question. Maybe, uh, ah, I see another question. Let's see whether it is for Vasil. Yes. Uh, so the question by Caro is uh, is a very relevant one. So transforming the district heating system to a hundred percent based renewable system doesn't mean that the project as a whole becomes a renewable generation project. What def what makes a component of the project renewables or not is the type of the investment. So if the investment is in in, in assets for generation and production of renewable energy, electricity, heating, uh, fuels, whatever, then this component falls into the scope of renewables component. If the asset in which the investment will go and the investment will fund is not an asset for the production of renewable energy specifically, then it's not renewables component. So if it's infrastructure, if it's pipeline, if it's grid, if it's the, the area, if it's the land, this is not renewables. But if it's the renewable generation plant and the facility that produces renewable energy, then yes, it's a renewables uh, component. So the next question by Bart is the exact definition of renewables. So renewables are defined in Article 2 of the Renewable Energy Directive. So there is a list with technologies for production of renewable energies. So everything that falls into this list of Article 2 of the Renewable Energy Directive is renewable energy. And uh, if it's electricity from uh, renewable sources, according to this definition, then yes, it is, uh, it is renewables. Um, the green molecule producing and conversion assets, no, the conversion is not renewables, it's only the production of the energy and the input for this energy is should be a source of renewables according to the, to the definition. So uh, the green molecule, if you're referring to, to hydrogen, so the production of the hydrogen molecule is not renewables, but the renewable energy, which is used for the electrolyzes in order to produce the green molecule, then yes, this is, uh, this is renewables. Uh, so uh, I, I don't want to, to make things more complicated to make them look more complicated, but renewables is everything which is defined as renewables in the renewable directive and renewables component is any asset 
which produces renewable energy that falls into the definition of renewables in the directive. So uh, I hope this, this clarifies sufficiently. Just wait 30 seconds to see whether this, your last uh, reply triggered any other burning question on, uh, on the policy part. Doesn't seem so for the moment. Okay. And we will move to the your award criteria, but you're fine. Yeah, I see it. Uh, thanks for reacting. Um, yeah, we can move to the award criteria part, knowing that, of course, we can come back to any of those points later on, but we are trying to maximize the presence of, uh, of Vasil as well. So, uh, but we have a full morning, so to go through the nitty gritty, so no problem. Um, Beatrice, the floor is yours for the award criteria, please. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Gianluca, and also to complement, uh, not only we have the entire morning, but uh, also we, if you have follow-up questions, we'll explain also later on in the day we will have an FAQ system, uh, so we, we remain, of course, available to reply in writing uh, to you uh, after this info day and to publish, let's say, the questions that we that we receive, so that they are available uh, for equal treatment to to everybody. Uh, let's move then to the se the section of the presentation concerning the evaluation. So, how are the projects or let's say your applications? selected and maybe we can also touch upon some of the questions that uh, that were that were raised and that might also help you to understand how, how let's say how the proposals will be scored will be assessed and that helps you also maybe to reflect what is your best strategy also for uh, for uh, for uh, for your let's say your possible application so this is really a crucial part uh, this is uh, where, let's say, your chances of success stand. Um, I want to maybe also to pass the message that uh, this call is restricted to, to three projects, basically. So we have an indicative budget of 30 million. It's indicative, so it could be increased if uh, there will be, let's say, applications uh, uh, worth, uh, let's say, being, uh, being selected under this, uh, under this call subject, of course, to the commission decision on that. Um, but uh, let's say the fact that it's only restricted to three projects does not make it, uh, let's say, less, um, let's say, less strict in a sense that uh, if you are, uh, let's say, if you want really to prepare your application, please consider really that uh, you have to have really a good level of quality. Uh, without, let's say, a good level of quality of preparation, of putting together, let's say, a good documentation and good explanations, and, and we'll come, let's say, now in a moment to the explanations, uh, you risk, let's say, not to pass, uh, not to pass the thresholds in the award criteria. So uh, make sure really you prepare as, let's say, a good application as best really as you can. Um, and we will help you also later on to go to go through it, how, how best to prepare, let's say, your application. Uh, but let's really go to the award criteria. Uh, so the call for proposals uh, stipulates that pro proposals are evaluated uh, according to five award criteria. So they are priority and urgency, maturity, quality, impact, and catalytic effect. Um, there is, uh, let's say, a quantitative, they are evaluated with a quantitative score, so from zero to five. For each award criteria, there is a minimum pass score of three and a maximum of five, and the minimum overall pass score is 15 out of 25. Um, uh, what does it mean? That in practice, uh, when you feel, let's say, when you go in the portal, you will see there is an application form across the document. Uh, there is an let's say application form and in particular, the technical description of it. So it's uh, the so-called part B. And in the part B, um, you will have to describe, let's say your project, but then there will be a number of sections that you have to fill in and uh, they correspond to the information that let's say are, is expected for the evaluators to, to, to have, let's say an assessment along the award criteria. And now we will go one by one, let's say, to explain 
uh, uh, DOR criteria and what are, let's say, the sections that you will have to fill in. So I'll try to, to explain that. Uh, so let's go maybe for the, with the first one. They are also in the order of the application form. So there you see uh, you will have different sections and um, basically you will have to demonstrate different things. The first one is the contribution to climate and energy target. And then th th therefore, let's say, provide information on how the envisaged CBRS project, so your project as a whole, will contribute to sectoral policy objectives and in particular to uh, the REST targets and the U2030 climate and energy target. Um, there is a section uh, also on what we call, let's say, the U added value. And basically, the call says that uh, the U added value of a CBRS project uh, is already demonstrated by the fact that it got a status. So, in a sense, let's say you have already been pre selected, and we can say that you know you have already a high level of U added value. But nevertheless, we would like you to explain um, also, let's say, to which extent. Uh, EU level action will help to reach policy objectives more effectively. There is also, let's say, and this is also the contribution of the CBRS project to other uh, policy objectives, this is what Vasil explained at the beginning. You will have a section on market integration as well to fill in for studies and works. So please uh, also uh, pay attention to that. And then there is a section where applicable uh, if your project uh, has um, synergies, let's say, with other sectors, like, for example, transport and digital, um, this part should also be filled in if it is uh, if it is applicable and also to explain how really um, the synergies will improve the socioeconomic climate or environmental benefits of your project. And that comes the point here that Vasil was explaining at the beginning. So this criterion is called priority and urgency. So this is where really, let's say, we, the commission, let's say, or during the evaluation, will have a possibility to rank the projects higher uh, according, let's say, to the priority of the call that priority will be given to proposals with proportionally high risk generation components. So, in practice, let's say projects with this high res generation component part will be given, let's say, higher priority in this award criteria. This is, let's say, one way to practically practically implement implement that. Um, I will stop here on priority and urgency, and I'll go a bit to maturity. Um, so, maturity means that let's say we want a little bit a reply to uh, the questions why are you applying to this call if i can put it also a bit uh, if you put a bit blunt so if your project is mature uh, so it means there is a certain readiness both uh, in terms of technical maturity there are also aspects of financial maturity which are more relevant for works than for studies then let's say we can say that it's good that you apply in this call. If your project is not mature, um, if what you propose, let's say, is not mature, or the activities that you intend to carry out are not mature, then perhaps it's better that these activities will be put for uh, a later call for proposals next year, for example. How we demonstrate this maturity? In the application, you have to provide information that uh, you have already completed or uh, steps or steps are envisaged to be completed very soon. And therefore, let's say we have a confirmation that uh, the activities you propose to carry out that can be done without delay. Now, what does it mean also in practice? Um, because we, you know, we, we don't have really, let's say a clear date when the activities uh, have to be, you know, have to start um, really in like literally now or in how many months. And um, I think we can say as a kind of rule of thumb uh, that let's say if your activities are envisaged to, to be started or the main activities eh, are envisaged to be started within next few months, like uh, within six months, 
then you have a high level of maturity for studies. For works, because we know that, let's say, preparation works, uh, construction, and uh, they have, let's say, longer lead times to arrive, let's say, at construction phase. So we recognize that, um, let's say, there is uh, more lead time for that. And therefore, we, we consider that um, up to 18 months, rule of thumb, really, rule of thumb, your project could be mature to start, let's say, the works then let's say then you are mature enough um it means let's say for us it's a confirmation because if your activities will start say within the next few months then we can finance uh, it's also budgetary aspect related to that it means that we can you know give you the pre-financing give you let's say the the payments for the budget foreseen under this call if we will have, let's say, expenditures that are foreseen very, very long in the future, then that's why we say perhaps it's better that, let's say, you consider that uh, that activities could be financed in later calls. And that is also maybe linked to the questions that we had uh, before. Do I apply separately for the various uh, assets in the, in the chain or do I apply at once? It is, of course, it's a bit of also the choice, your choice. Um, you could apply, let's say, if if these studies are expected, let's say, to be done very soon, then it's better to apply now. If if you want to group these studies because something is foreseen very soon and something is foreseen maybe a bit later, you could also do. But you could also decide to split. Um, because maybe for studies which are foreseen a bit later, maybe you still want to carry out some preparatory activities, perhaps might be better to wait. But again, really, this is a bit your decision. Uh, we cannot really, you know, give really individual advice on that. But this maturity aspect is very important to be taken into account in, 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 that, uh, in that decision. So and maybe to conclude on that, you will find in the application form Therefore, let's say the type of confirmation that we are asking. Uh, basically, we want you us. We want you also to explain to us that what you intend to carry out is the next logical step in the CBS project development. If you want to carry out, let's say, activities, but it turns out that to, you had to first, let's say, to carry out something in advance before uh, before doing the activities you propose then your uh, proposal does not represent the next logical step. Um, and therefore, let's say your project, you, you might have, let's say, a low score on maturity. So pay attention to that. We are also aware that uh, there could be also parallel activities um, in project preparation. So also maybe in that parallelism or let's say in time, you could also elaborate in your proposal. We will also ask you um, to provide information on the status of cooperation mechanism, because that's very relevant in terms of uh, the, your CBRS application. Um, and also if there are, uh, and that's also particularly relevant for works, there are a number of sections uh, where we will ask you to explain what's the level of um, preparation for you in terms of authorization, approval, and permit because that's really crucial if you want really to enter in construction phase. And so you will find a number of uh, sections on that uh, quite detailed uh, where we ask you really to detail um, your authorization process. There is also information in terms of what are, let's say, procurement uh, contracts which are planned during the implementation. And uh, there is also a section related to financial maturity, because maturity is both technical maturity as well as financial maturity. Financial maturity is very important for works. A bit, I would say, less for studies where we consider that, um, let's say, yeah, preparatory phase of a project, not all information in terms of uh, commitment, financial commitments might be taken. So this we recognize. That closes maturity it was quite long, but I hope uh, it explained. Um, it was, let's say, this will give you some important information. Uh, the criterion, our criterion quality, uh, is a bit, I must say, I like to say that it's a bit a classical criterion. 
uh, in a sense of evaluation, in a sense that there um, we evaluate the soundness of the implementation plan that you propose. But from technical, financial point of view, uh, you will have to describe the resources that you need, both human and financial, to implement the project. You'll have to describe your organizational structure, how you intend to cooperate between applicants if there is more than one. Um, project management issues, uh, uh, quality assurance and control procedures. And I would say very important uh, in for what concerns, let's say, this type of projects, which are quite, uh, um, you know, take, uh, as I mentioned before, a long time uh, to be, you know, before being realized. Uh, the, it's important that you tell us the risks uh, that you have identified so that you do a proper risk assessment and also mitigating me mitigation measures for these risks. So please take this also quite, um, quite seriously. And another point is that uh, do not, uh, let's say, um, we have a restriction in the call that project management costs should not exceed 10% of total project costs. So do not uh, over, over, uh, overwhelm or over inflate, let's say, um, the application, your application for with uh, project management cost. Uh, the purpose of CEF is really to fund activities, but not, let's say, project management cost. And to our experience, they should not exceed 10%. So if uh, we see cost beyond that, uh, we, they will be cut during the evaluation. Uh, impact, uh, it's also, let's say, quite a comprehensive uh, work criteria because it has a lot of elements and uh, there is also a distinction between studies and works. So for studies, we will only look at uh, explanations on uh, the first two bullet points. So this is about uh, the description of your uh, financial obstacles. Uh, so what are, let's say, the, the, are there financial obstacles um, in, uh, let's say, in, in your, um, to execute, let's say, your activities? Um, basically, and that we will see also in the other work criteria, which is the catalytic effect, you will have to make a case that you have financial obstacles, um, because that's a bit the underlying reasons why you are applying for funding. So, Let's say, I think for studies, again, in general, we in the past, we have looked at it with, uh, let's say, qualitative, uh, with some more qualitative explanation on uh, what are the financial obstacles and how public funding would have to overcome those financial obstacles. So also, if you could describe there uh, also with amounts. When it comes, let's say, to works, we have the same, uh, this is also retained, and that's also probably very much, much more important because their insufficient commercial viability is also a criterion to apply, uh, a criterion to receive grant for works under CEF. So there the, we will have, let's say, a number more of, uh, you will see there will be a number of, um, uh, of boxes or that, you, and let's say, additional information on uh, that you have to fill in. And we will also, let's say, not only in the application form B, but there are also additional documents which are requested, like um, a, a business plan and also um, a business plan spreadsheet. So where, let's say, this uh, information of insufficient commercial viability will be, will be checked against. Um, there is also an aspect of assessing the cross-border dimension of your project, valid both for studies and works. And then for, um, uh, for works, uh, more important, uh, the threshold is again higher. So there are also, um, and you're really much closer, let's say, now to the implementation and to the completion of the project. So there, there will be also um, uh, <clears throat> information to be provided regarding the economic, social, environmental impact, including the climate impact of your project. So there, again, fill in the application form B, but also, let's say, there are additional documents like the CBA uh, report, so something you already filled in for your status, but should be, again, attached to this application, um, and the CBA tool that should be, uh, 
that should be provided. And there is also information on climate impact and climate resilience. Um, that's uh, very important also for, for works. And again, uh, why we were talking of CBA uh, tool and CBA report, because for uh, works under SEF energy, there is a, let's say, a higher threshold. So uh, not only you have to have, let's say, uh, then there must be, let's say, a justification provided or a demonstration that uh, the benefits are, or the cost saving are significant. So that's why we, this will be evaluated, will be assessed, um, and, um, and okay. And therefore, let's say information also on the C, on your CBA is very important there. The, on the last award criteria, catalytic effect. So that uh, builds upon this concept of having, let's say, financial obstacles to be overcome. And they are a bit linked uh, here, the two explanations. So then in this catalytic effect, you will have basically to explain why are you, if you have financial obstacles, then why are you uh, recurring, let's say, to the EU grant? Uh, and in which sense this will accelerate or facilitate the envisaged cross-border project in comparison to a situation without EU funding. Um, so it will be important also, uh, let's say, to explain, if I may say, really that uh, why you are preferring the EU grant in comparison to maybe other, um, other sources of funding. And that, that links also maybe to financial obstacles. And therefore, let's say uh, the relation with the gap in the financial of the project. If you are also um, expecting to uh, apply under other forms of EU support, for example, the recovery and resilience facility, if applicable, you should also please provide this, um, this, this information. So that closes a bit the explanation of the award criteria, and we can go now to the end of, let's say, of presentation, just to explain you what happens at the end of the evaluation. Um, so at the end of the evaluation, uh, whether you are successful or not, you will be result, uh, you'll be informed by a letter. The successful proposals will be invited for grant preparation, and the other ones may put on a reserve list or rejected. Now, um, invitation to a grant preparation, um, it's not a formal commitment for funding because there might be, there might be still um, checks that are still ongoing, like the financial capacity, exclusion checks. Um, so it is already excellent that you have been already pre-selected. But uh, we have really to carry out a number of checks and really conclude the grant agreement. Uh, so this invitation is only the first step for that. And then I also want to let you know that if you believe the evaluation procedure was flawed, uh, you can also submit a complaint and this will be the procedure will be explained in the evaluation letter. The last slide is, let's say, if you are successful. Then you, we will invite you to grant preparation uh, with you project officer. And um, so the grant preparation will be a dialogue in fine tuning technical and financial aspects. And if there are application, if there are recommendations from the evaluations, they will need to be implemented as well. Uh, we will have a uh, also a session later on on the model grant agreement uh, by our legal officer, so they will explain you and normally let's say, well, the provisions which are there are not negotiable. Um, so we will give you also all the references to the model grant agreement and the relevant documents that can be found in portal reference document, but they will also explain to you later on. With this, I want to conclude this um, part of, uh, let's say, the info day. So we are here for questions, I think. Thank you, Beatrice. So we have time for the Q&A here. We have already uh, answered to some questions, but uh, oh. obviously you can uh, raise any any question at this stage. You can do it via the chat or, or even uh, Raising your hand, you can also uh, do it, and we uh, will open your mic. 
so feel free. Uh, there were there were while you were speaking, that there were questions related to the definition of renewables uh, in the retour uh, from uh, Leire. I answered uh, in the chat, uh, but uh, please feel free to uh, step in if you wish to complement or any anything else from the participants. If you wanna take the floor, that's also. Nice uh, that we can do it uh, as we are not in the normal, more bro broadcasting uh, setting. So, looking forward to for questions. So, I hope at least uh, we made a bit the distinction between studies and works uh, and uh, the maturity aspect also, because I know with some of you we have had some um, preliminary preliminary discussion. Um, so that's, uh, I think the maturity is possibly one of the elements that really you have to, you have to take care. Uh, because if your activities are starting soon, as I explained, then your project is mature. If you are, uh, if you are, um, if your activities will start much, much later, especially for studies, for works and said, we give a bit of more of a longer lead time, then we strongly recommend you that let's say, to apply for uh, maybe the call of next year or, or later on. Because if, as long, let's say, as you are um, in the cross-border rest list, uh, as we believe you will be, um, you will be, remain eligible. A lot of question from uh, later on the red two, uh, red three. Uh, so once the red mm -hmm. three is closed, would the renewable definition of the new directive uh, apply. I mean, we we cannot say cannot, today, but uh, I think so. Yes, that's uh, should be yeah. should be yeah should be the case. So in principle, yes, but, but uh, we we cannot know, of course. Uh, mm. uh, so the, the legal basis will be set by by the 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 new directive itself. Okay, hope that answers. But of course, what is clear is that we cannot uh, we cannot consider it. Of course, at this stage, no. uh, anything that is not officially uh, approved and into force uh, that that is uh, simply not applicable to us. So of course, it's useful for you, of course, to follow because uh, you can see the development and where. Where, where the legislators are going, uh, but of course, negotiation can change uh, the course anytime. Okay, uh, any anything on the on the award criteria or uh, anything else on the previous part? So you may have questions. So is it clear to everybody? Any 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 comments on uh, on the on the policy side as well? Uh, See whether we can answer or not. But, uh, at least good to to take. There's some hands. Yeah. Can you can you open the mic to person? Hello, everybody. Um, you you can you can hear me? Nice. Um, uh, we have uh, one, one question. Uh, did we uh, right understand that uh, the the grid is not a uh, REST technology from from the definition because we will need uh, the the new grid lines to put the reduced energy to our customers. There was some echo, but if, I think we got uh, got the point. So the question is about the grid, uh, whether it is part of the if it is considered renewable uh, energy generation. So the the renewable energy really we are uh, on the generation. It's it or the technologies as to say, uh, it's really what we we see in the in the red two article that I pasted in the reply to. Later, uh, so 
uh, these are really the technology that are uh, considered uh, as uh, the renewable energy generation itself. Any aspect related to the grid, it's 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 part of the of the additional components. So these are uh, treated as additional components in the in the self regulation and in the delegated act um, related to the CBRS uh, project. Uh, that means that uh, we'll have to comply with the uh, three additional uh, requirements of being uh, uh, being uh, integrated and enable the um, integral part of the project, enable the integration, and uh, be uh, considered as uh, ancillary. So it's not by mere fact that it's part of the grid is not eligible. It's just that uh, it has to comply with the three. Uh, condition that are specified in Article 3 of the Delega Delegated Act. Um, and then the prioritization again, it's a uh, uh, point that uh, Vasil from the DG Energy was uh, pointing out at the beginning, it really applies only to words. So if you're looking mm -hmm. for studies, we are really uh, not, not, not applying any specific uh, criteria, so to say, uh, giving priority to the rest generation part. No, and, and it doesn't mean that they are excluded, it's just that, let's say, they will be considered under, let's say, our criterion priority, they will have, let's say, probably a higher score. But at the same time, you have to have also all the other aspects well done in your application. So you have to be mature, you have to demonstrate good quality, good implementation, you have to demonstrate financial gap. So, yeah, so it, this, let's say these aspects, these elements are not excluded um, in the call. And, and I, I wanted want maybe to come back, back. there was this question, I think also from Berlitz about the land. Uh, land is not an eligible under SEF. So land costs are, are excluded a priori. Purchase of land. Uh, this is this is not eligible. This is not eligible. Okay, yeah, I'm just with uh, answer from Gerlitz. Yeah, fine. Okay, uh, and I see Matthew, uh asking for the floor. Can you open the mic? Hi, my name is Matthew Wendowski. Uh, I'm we part of yes, oh, yes, Gerlitz Gorzelec project. And uh, yes, I, I, I'm a bit confused with this uh, rest and non-rest part, and especially uh, the percentage, because you mentioned that part of the projects might be rest, and the second part non-rest, like a grid, right? Like a network. And uh, the projects will be scored based on the rest percentage uh, in the total capex. So we are there are three projects on the short list, and let's say one project will be fifty five percent, second sixty, and the third seventy percent of the rest, right? So of course, obviously, with the the highest amount of the rest capex cost, will be eligible for financing. And what if the the project containing seventy percent of rest? Uh, in capex has this 30% of non rest is the 30% for the grid or for other works going to be uh, financed as well or not yeah so there are different elements here so first of all if we have a, a, let's say a 100% rest generation project which has flows on uh, other aspects of its application because perhaps it is not mature, because it does not demonstrate the financial gap, this will not pass the award criteria, this will not be proposed for financing. So this is really very important for, for, for all of you to consider. So I, I don't want to downsize this aspect of priority to rest generation, but the application must be, first of all, good in all aspects. Otherwise, it will not be financed. So if you are not commercially viable for works, you will not be financed, even if your proposal is 100% rest generation. So then if all, pro if all aspects of your application are good, and here we're only talking about works, 
because the scope of studies does not make a distinction between a covering a rest generation equipment or a non rest generation equipment. Everything is, let's say, equally possible. If then, if only, let's say, for the works, if all other aspects are equal, then if it will be a problem of budget availability, then we will, then there will be a, a way to be put in place how to prioritize the applications um, by giving, for example, a higher priority score, a score under priority. But there are, let's say, other aspects that you have to consider. So if you really are, let's say, serious concerning preparing an application for SEF here, please, let's say, put all the efforts to prepare a very good one in all aspects have to be covered and you have to succeed in all our work criteria, as I explained. So there will be, let's say, if the application, let's say, is, let's say there is competition, but we have to see the budget availability, there could be additional budget or not. So don't, the, I don't uh, agree with this, let's say, um, way of looking at things. This is not as we have explained. I, so I hope that I clarified that, that there are let's uh, say, the priority. There is a priority, but there are other aspects, let's say, to be to be considered as well. Yes, well, I I presume that all the application will be you know perfect and all the the criteria criteria will uh, be uh, met. But this is just you know to understand the the, the logic behind this uh, this division for the uh, rest part and non rest within a project. And the cost eligibility for the the co-financing. That, that that's my main issue. No, the, Just, the, yeah. Um, if if the if the the, the priority sources, because, has nothing to do with the cost eligibility. So all the costs are eligible, even yeah. those not less. Yes, even because those you, not you less, distinct... they are eligible. Okay, thank you. That okay. If that was the question, yes, but land purchase will never yes. be eligible because it is not a cost category that is accepted in the program no no for for, so for the us grid, the most important is the green yes part. it's eligible but the land because i saw a question on the land the land purchase is not eligible independent if it's rest or not it's not eligible that's clear thank you very much okay thank you Okay, thank you. So, so really, uh, this point about uh, the prioritization, it's really about uh, how, how to establish, so to say, the project that will be selected, but it applies only to works and uh, all things being equal. So, uh, it's, it's a full evaluation. So, don't focus too much on how much rest you have in it. Um, focus on, the, on, on developing a, a good quality proposal. Uh, because, okay, if you have a very good proposal uh, and you have uh, both components, uh, uh, in that case, it's likely that you will be selected compared to, to other projects that are a bit less uh, good uh, in, in overall, but have a bigger as components, so to say. So, it's, it's not, there's nothing, there's no maths uh, behind there. We are really looking for, uh, for the good project and in case two projects are really coming at equal equal quality and they have a stronger one of the two have a stronger rest component and if we are talking about works then uh, this distinction uh, may apply and we have to see how but there's no uh, formula or percentages or, or that in any case as the teacher was saying uh, regardless of all these if you are selected the whole project is eligible provided that it complies with the eligibility rules uh but uh, yeah there's no distinction there's no uh good part of bad part of the project or preferred part or less preferred part so once you are approved the whole project is approved and you have to comply with the eligibility rules uh, and so there are there are costs that are not eligible in general and these are listed also in the in the in the in the code document and uh, notably this part on the land uh, purchase is um, uh, explained 
or other like uh, the key or other aspect that we'll look at it uh, later on. I'm just looking whether there are, okay, there are, if there are any requests for the floor, much is fine for you, I see your chat, great. Um, let's see, is it, no? Uh, okay. Camilla uh, also uh, inserted in the chat some uh, some reference uh, that is useful for you. I invite you to check it out. There's a link there. Okay. For the moment, I don't see any hands up. Uh, we are five minutes ahead of the break, but we could uh, could break it now unless there's any request for the floor which I don't see, no? Okay, we can break it now and then uh, come back in 15 minutes. So 10 past, was it uh, foreseen, right? 10 past 11. And if in the meantime, you have uh, questions, uh, please write them in the chat so we can start from there uh, after the break and uh, and develop further. Then we will look really at the specifics on how to write the application form, uh, what are the good things to, to, to think about to go to, to come up with a quality proposal. Um, and uh, also the question about from girl it's about when the project can start so this all this aspect will be touched upon uh, and then uh, there is the, the presentation from Nadine on the grant agreement uh, that will tackle also quite a few questions that we received uh, by email uh, uh, in the past days so uh, I'm uh, talking to Gerlitz uh, partners now. Um, we will come back to that, to many of those questions also in the, in the legal uh, in the presentation about the grant agreement. And then we will have a look at the portal, how it works. Uh, so, but don't hesitate to keep writing in the chat if you have other questions during the break and then see you at uh, 10 past uh, 11 for the second part. Many thanks.
Okay, everyone. A few seconds. Uh, the clock will be 10 past. I'll let people get back to their laptops and headsets. And then we can kick start with the second part. Um, it was useful, informative, uh, this, this, uh, this previous part, and then we'll really go into the details now uh, on preparation of successful proposals. So I will give the floor directly to Camilla, who will present this part of the, of the info day. Thanks, Camilla. Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Camila Pakel. I'm a project advisor um, in uh, Gianluca sector and um, Beatrice's unit. Uh, I'll walk you through preparing a successful proposal. We have 20 minutes together and uh, I have 27 slides roughly, so it will be a quick ride. Um, and please write your questions in the chat. We're most happy to answer them later. Um, first, we'll go, we'll have a tour of the funding and tender portal. portal. Um, a few words on terminology and the concepts that we are using in this uh, grant agreement uh, and the project management uh, and your proposal writing and um, environment, the quality of the proposal we will be looking at and your checklist, so something helpful uh, in applying. Um, uh, the funding and tender portal, you may be already aware uh, that it exists. It is a hub for all different funding opportunities that uh, the EU has. Uh, and uh, connecting your facility is uh, part of this portal. You will find um, the call uh, open uh, and all documents and the topic descriptions as well as details uh, are provided there. Mostly um, for you uh, to note is that you've got the call page with the different templates, but you have also the a direct link to the user guide. So the, these links are provided in the slides. Uh, in terms of the project, and I anticipate here the question maybe a bit more specific from Simon, is um, that we use uh, the term project for the um, for for the action basically of the that you're applying for so while we also use the the, the term of the cbrs project in in general in the uh, context of your application we will be thinking of the project that you are seeking the, the self-funding for hence for instance if you apply for studies this is your project this is your action and um and we we understand that CBRS project will stem beyond the studies and, and it will be in the future implemented, but um, we, we stick to the, the, the project as, as you are ready uh, to apply for the self-funding uh, in, your, in your proposal, in your application. So if you, if you um, refer to the wider project, uh, then please write the CBRS status project or always use this, this kind of distinction so that we don't uh, don't get confused whether to talk about this this part of the CBRS project or the CBRS project uh, in total. Uh, work package is a major subdivision of the project. So you've got here the uh, this is up to up to you how you subdivide your project, but it may be uh, linked to typically there is one work package linked to uh, project management. There may be other. Uh, big chunks of work that it makes sense for you to divide. Uh, sometimes they um, they can be running in parallel. Or sometimes they may be sequential. But in any case, uh, this um, choice has to be justified uh, by you. And uh, obviously, um, if they are sequential, um, one that is later has to depend on the earlier one so it cannot be the other way around and and all of this is, is a logic that only you may um, have at this point and uh, and the evaluators need to be convinced about the, the justification uh, if we look at the work packages um, uh, subdivision for the subdivision we we've got the tasks so we've got the task uh, to identify as part of your work package. And here, um, it's also important that um, you uh, can give them uh, like a um, name that makes sense. You describe them shortly. You mention 
who will be participating on, on them and in what capacity if you foresee subcontracting. Uh, you also should say how much of the task will be subcontracted. Um, don't uh, define subtasks. That is not necessary to go into so much detail, but it definitely helps to um, to be uh, as clear and the, the description as possible. Um, an example of here of the subdivision of work package for instance, the, that is dedicated to project management and coordination. Uh, you can have um, you can have a task that is a link to the coordination of meetings or project monitoring. Um, or drafting of a cooperation agreement, for instance. Uh, a milestone in our terminology is a major control point um, in the project that uh, helps to uh, to chart progress. It is something that uh, is is, for instance, publication of a tender. This is a great day in the day of your project. It's uh, the, everyone knows when it happens. It is not about preparing only the documents because the documents themselves are more in the definition of our deliverables, so a tangible thing that you can touch. But if you have the documents that are never published, for instance, we, we cannot consider them a milestone. So a milestone is actually something that happened and you are proud of it and they can define the project progress. Deliverable is a project output. They are helpful, but they will not be um, kind of a substitute for reaching a milestone. So approved cross-border or uh, approved uh, cross-benefit analysis or, or some kind of a cross-border cooperation um, support letter, a letter of intent by the member state. Uh, th this is all a deliverable that you may include uh, and that should help you reach the milestones. Um, when we look at the proposals, and uh, and we've heard about it uh, already quite a lot before the break, we look for excellent proposals. Uh, we uh, look at them uh, holistically, uh, but also um, we don't need um, them to be over complex, over uh, over elaborated. So please use simple language, avoid jargon. Uh, we use jargon. Uh, this is the nature of of the EU funds that we have to use these, these terminology that I just mentioned, like milestones, deliverables, and work packages, but also there, there are other words of jargon in your universes that may be very familiar to you, but but please try to, to use the simple language and also um, avoid even the, the kind of um, grant management jargon. And the information should be easy to find. Uh, so it is part of the quality of the proposal that the, the information is is clear and coherent between different sections of the um, of the proposal that um, that you address the award criteria and that uh, that the the proposal is complete. So we will not be looking on other websites, for instance. Then please check if you have all the mandatory annexes, and there are also um, uh, possibilities to upload the voluntary annexes. Um, then, when you look at the, the scope of the project, uh, think about these uh, questions uh, that are on the slide um, in the sense of what is your project about? So, so, as we said, it can be a part of the CBRS project. It usually is because you're applying for studies or works. Uh, for instance, uh, what, what are the technical parameters? So you, you should know about, you know, if you think about data collection, what, what is the data that you need to collect? So what, what, are, what are the technical specificities? How and when will the project objectives be reached? And all of this we covered. Who will carry out the project? Think about who you want to involve in your consortium, who you think uh, will be needed as a subcontractor, what type of company, what type of services, um, and uh, make sure that the, if, if there are key work packages to be implemented by, um, uh, by a specific technical, for instance, uh, companies, they might be a very good partner to your project. So try to also think about what makes sense to be Built as a consortium and how much you want to subcontract and knowing that the subcontracting has its own rules where you have to 
uh, proof um, sound financial management will touch it later and then uh, what are the expected results of the project why are you proposing the action uh, finally uh, the work packages uh, also we will be looking at them uh, in terms of uh, what, what their aim is what the aim of the work packages is whether they are clearly described and whether the tasks are clearly described uh, and um, whether they connect to the milestones. Uh, the, there is a rule of thumb regarding the milestones. We have a few questions about them uh, in the past, so just be sure that you have at least one, uh, one milestone per year, that you have a um, starting and end milestone, and that the means of verification are rea reliable and realistic. That's just an example of how you can present the milestone in, in, the, um, in the application form. Um, and uh, yeah, just to say that if it, 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 it will also depend on whether you have a project that is uh, lasting more than one year or, or uh, less than one year, but if it's a more than one year project, which is probably what will be your case, uh, there would be um, ideally at least one milestone per year. And um, uh, the coherence and this common thread running through the proposal combining all the objectives and work packages is, is a very important uh, aspect to think of. So uh, it, it has to make sense. Your proposal, when you read it, when you read the work packages quickly without knowing the project, you understand what it is about. You understand that the resources were planned well, that it is all coherent uh, within resources, human resources, other resources, but also time resources. So all of this has to make one coherent part. Uh, the information is presented in a logical way, and also there are no contradictions and um, and um, basic basic common sense uh, rule applies. Uh, the justification of resources uh, and connection to the project scope that we're looking for would be uh, would be part of your uh, proposal application already at this stage. Uh, there is also a rule that the project management costs should roughly stay within the 10% of the total project costs, and um, the um, this is something to be. To be also aware if you have, for instance, very big discrepancy between the costs for different project partners, um, this also would need to be explained and and ba basically you, you, you explain why you need, for instance, to people working full time on a, for instance, one page document that might be not very convincing. So that there, that there again, a common sense rule um, applies and there's something that will be evaluated at the evaluation stage. Uh, we also look at your risk assessment, whether you are um, aware of the risks, whether you have a policy of mitigating them uh, already planned for, and whether you, uh, the risk assessment is actually an interesting part because it also shows how, how embedded in reality you are at this stage. So we, we can all already gauge a little bit how much of an optimist, uh, pessimist or realist you are. Um, and obviously the realism is, is uh, always somewhere in line with its common sense rule. Um, next slide. I think uh, for the starting date, uh, is, as there was a question, we have a few options here. It can be the same as the grant agreement signature date, uh, which is our default option. Uh, it can be after the grant agreement signature date, uh, which is agreed with uh, with us uh, during the grant agreement preparation. It must be justified, but it doesn't have to be a force majeure. It has to maybe adjust to some, something that makes most sense. And obviously, it cannot start one year after the grant agreement signature. We talk about days, weeks, mostly. And uh, before grant agreement signature, um, also can be agreed with CINEA, but never before the submission date. So it is still uh, limited to, to the submission date. And then we've got the closure date of the project, um, which, uh, which has to end by the end of 2028. 
please check uh, the completeness of your documents. So we will be looking at the application form part A, uh, which is a structured data that you introduce directly on funding and tender portal. I think you have uh, can have a code with the kind of a um, PDF copy, but but everything is to be encoded in the portal. Then you have a um, part B, which is a Word document that will be then transformed to PDF. And it contains technical description of the project. Um, and um, there is also another um, another part to be attached is to the detailed budget uh, table per uh, work package. Um, and it is in the form of Excel file. Uh, we would like also to see a complete uh, logical Gantt chart, uh, which helps to have very quick overview of your planning and, and your logic. And then um, the letter of support or the, the agreement of the consent member states uh, for the cooperation agreement. So this uh, has to be a fully fledged cooperation agreement uh, for the works uh, proposals. Uh, but for the studies, you can um, you can basically uh, provide us with an update uh, of uh, what happened because you already had to have something for the. Uh, for the CBRS status application. Environmental compliance file that is also applicable for works uh, and for studies if there is any physical intervention. So we also have that cases. Uh, and for uh, studies uh, that have no physical intervention, you can just uh, click the relevant options there and uh, upload the document, but not much effort is required. Uh, you're asked to provide your annual activity report and a list of previous relevant projects uh, from the last four years. Uh, some of the applicants are waived from that re requirement and it's mainly the public bodies, member states organizations and TSOs as well as international organizations. Um, we uh, check uh, for works and updated full cost benefit analysis as based on your CBRES um, status application. Uh, so you've done it, you know what it is about, uh, an updated full CBA is needed for works, proposals, a business plan, and other assessment showing that you are um, commercially non viable as a project and a fully fledged uh, signed cooperation agreement. The environmental compliance file uh, is to be completed in full for works and studies with physical intervention, as mentioned, and um, this has to be filled in for each applicant and for each member state where the project is implemented. And that um, note that you need a signature from the competent authority in the member state and declaring that Natura 2000 sites uh, are um, not affected or if they are affected in what way. And um, and no, normally we 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 um, require a certification that there is no impact uh, or significant impact on Natura 2000 areas. Um, that uh, said, uh, for studies without physical intervention, you just click, and that it is um, without physical intervention, and we have it still in the file that you declared and certified that no physical intervention is planned as part of the project, which is also. Uh, relevant information for us. Um, the annual activity reports are um, requested to, to verify your operational capacity for each applicant and the beneficiary. Um, and normally it's something that your companies or your organizations have already uh, prepared every year, so that nothing specific needs uh, to be uh, prepared for this proposal. And there are those um, entities that are uh, waived from this requirement, as already mentioned. The letter of support uh, has to be signed by the ministries of the participating member states um, uh, that will be implementing the future cooperation agreement, which means that it has to be the competent ministry. So, for instance, you cannot go to the Ministry of, of, of Culture it's not just enough to, to be um, having a ministerial endorsement. You have to have the competent ministry's endorsement and that um, this letter of support can be signed by the regional level if the region is competent. We will need uh, supporting evidence that the, of the competence of the region, ideally if it is a central government, um, somehow a stamp of competence 
that that endorses the region to implement the CBRS project and the cooperation agreement. Member state concerns should be understood as the member states and the territory of which the proposed project is planned to be implemented. So uh, for uh, studies without physical intervention, we, um, we, we assume that it's the country of the applicant. You have more information about the, the these um, cooperation agreements in our frequently asked questions and also in the regulations. Uh, if you have questions about that, also please write them in the chat. Please keep in mind uh, that um, depending on your status, uh, you will have to um, implement your grant agreement in line with the EU and national law on public procurement. Uh, so, uh, especially think about it, for instance, in terms of subcontracting, in terms of purchase of major items, um, this procurement rules is a big thing in CNA. We, we look at it carefully and we also work with auditors who look at it even more carefully. So, uh, there, everything is under very strict over, oversight uh, from uh, the EU because it's the EU taxpayers' money and that we are the guardians of. So please um, make sure that you are ready that, uh, for your procurement to be verified at payment time. And that be aware that non-compliance leads to rejection of costs um, or reduction of this, this, the payment. So it is a very, um, very normal thing to be done if we see irregularities to inquire and the leverage that the EU has to, to prevent any uh, kind of irregularities or, or to, to somehow avoid spending money uh, where it shouldn't go is by, by this rejection of cost of reduction of it. So it is a very real uh, sanction that SINA can, um, can deploy. Uh, this, the, the safest thing not to, not to talk about sanctions even is to, to, to apply sound financial management. We talk about the principles of economy, efficiency, and effectiveness, and and in in practice, it means that you you look for the best value for money, and this not is not your feeling, it's not your intuition, but it is a very pragmatic um, action of going to the market and asking for at least three offers, showing that you looked for competition, uh, you and uh, you considered quality of service, for instance, and or the the best, best price quality ratio or the lower price lowest price that you avoided conflict of interest so this is also very important and that you uh, applied these uh, in a transparent manner so for instance for for some entities it may mean as much as publication uh, of it uh, on the in the in the national official journal or sometimes on the website uh, so but it has to be publicly and transparently published and there is also the requirement of equal treatment and non-discrimination, uh, which is uh, based on our treaties um, and the free movement of goods, freedom of establishment and freedom to provide services. So, so uh, all, of, all of this has to be also taken into account, knowing that probably your organizations already do so. Uh, so in a sense, it's just a continuation of the good practices that you have in place. Um, the status of those contracting procedures, authorization and approvals and permits uh, has to be already mentioned in the, uh, in the part on legal, administrative and technical issues. So you can, you can uh, put them in and here we talk about um, maybe already some uh, tendering procedures that you've launched and you, you'd like to continue uh, uh, using also some procurement that has been already put in place in the past. Uh, if it is based on sound financial management, it can still very well be part of the project. Uh, also the approvals and permitting uh, are re the relevant ones. And then uh, the section that is uh, circled in red, subcontracting is also something important. Uh, you, you have to estimate the percentage that you'll subcontract and knowing that at this point, you, you probably don't know yet who will be subcontracted because you will go to a market and you'll seek competitive offers. And this is how you'll prove that uh, the best value for money or lowest price was respected. 
um, if you if you fear there is a, a risk of fraud in your uh, project implementation and it might be that it's not you it's your partner or you there is something that is a not um, not regular in in the kind of award for instance of contracts um, other aspects of financial management let us know we have uh, colleagues at the um, anti-fraud office of the european union and um, that is uh, a very good cooperation so there is um, there is a safeguard of the eu taxpayers money and uh, my last point, um, maybe on the more positive side um, here, please check um, before you uh, apply um, that uh, you are in the scope of the work program 2022. Every word in the work program was carefully put there. So it is all very uh, relevant to read it carefully and uh, check that you are in the scope and that you are um, able to submit by 23rd of February, by 5 p.m. Don't leave it to after the St. Valentine's because this is probably too late to apply. Um, please start the thinking process, the, the consortium building process, all of this takes time. And we will appreciate your early thinking, early questions also to us so that we can still help you. And um, don't leave the submission on the last day as we are looking for excellent proposals. Um, then once you're ready, encode all sections of application uh, form in, of part A directly in the platform on the portal, then the part B uh, also please read it through, complete, uh, scan and upload application. Um, and it will be First, that was word, but when you upload it, this will be, become a PDF. And then uh, please uh, for, don't forget to attach all the mandatory annexes. Proofread your proposal, do last checks. Uh, maybe someone who wasn't working on the proposal directly, because sometimes when you work on the files for too long, you start overseeing even major, major missing items. Be, be sure it's complete. Don't forget the risk assessment. Don't forget any of this as it uh, all uh, is relevant and needed for the evaluation uh, evaluators who can only assess your proposal on the basis of the of what you provide. We will not be um, working with any assumptions for uh, for, for the evalu evaluators or, or, or websites, additional documents that were not part of the proposal. Make sure that your proposal is precise and that uh, clearly responds to the questions asked and that it uh, demonstrates the benefit of, of self energy funding and uh, make sure that you submit the proposal using the template and the application forms that we provide. And it is not an option, so you have to use our templates. Thank you very much. You can follow us on different social media and contact us by email at CNASF Energy Calls. We are here a friendly, a friendly team, as you probably know us already. We try to respond quickly. If we don't, that means you get a, a, a tricky question. We need to consult with the GNR probably, our other uh, support colleagues. And, um, and please also bear in mind that we cannot give you any specific advice to your proposals that would uh, be detrimental to your competitors, basically. So if, if there is anything that uh, is also applicable to others and we can answer that question uh, we will answer to you but also then publish this um, this answer and question as an faq that will be anonymized of course so we will not uh, breach any confidentiality of your project details thank you very much for your attention and um over to you john there was, so as you were speaking, there was a question from Simon regarding the, in this this uh, point on project versus action, uh, more specifically on the application form template. Uh, there are references to either the one or the two. So we're talking about projects. Uh, um, when it comes to the application form, we refer basically to the action that is uh, proposed. In some cases, there are references to the wider CBRS project, like to explain uh, 
we ask you to explain the contribution or the impact to the wider or how does it fit to the wider in the wider context of the CBRS. But any question uh, that are in the application form, if I'm not mistaken, there's no uh, that they are all referred to the action itself that is proposed for self funding. <clears throat> So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. to say that um, we uh, we try to use the word action so that not to confuse you with the CBRS projects as such. So action would be the, 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 the part of the project that you look for for the self funding for. But unfortunately, the, the EU grants environment, so the funding and tender portals uh, does not so uses sometimes interchangeably these terms. So uh, maybe let's stick to the. CBRS project, which would be the, the big project and action or just project simply as as the, the one that you apply for. So, so, um, yeah, we just cannot influence the whole infrastructure of the funding portal and the templates, but um, in our specific program, definitely we have to pay more attention as as um, the funded action is part of the bigger CBRS project. And, um, yeah, you were touching upon on the on the public procurement. I believe uh, Nadine later will explain uh, this point also in the grant agreement. There were questions also we received about uh, possibility to sort of sequence the tenders and uh, well, it, again Nadine probably will explain that uh, that part. But uh, keep in mind um, all the aspect of our procurement and a typical problem is about this artificial splitting sometimes. So, uh, but I guess, yeah, Nadine, Nadine you will you'll go through in the, and later on in the, in the agreement in the, in the model grant agreement presentation. Uh, I just encourage you to keep uh, posting in the chat questions and then we'll have also anyhow a, a Q and A again later on, but uh, feel free to, to, to do it so as it goes and while you do so, uh, I can present uh, the shortly the budget uh, part uh, of, the, uh, of the, the requirement for the budget. So basically, there are two main uh, two main entries, so to say, of 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 cost of of budget uh, forecasted budget in the in the in the templates. One is the the cost category, and the other one is the work package uh, um, block, so to say. Both are mandatory to be encoded uh, either directly in the portal and uh, uh, or uh, in the in the Excel attached that will have to be uploaded in the portal. Um, the breakdown of cost categories you see it also in the whole document at page uh, 17 and 18. You have the whole list. Um, Watch out! There are specific uh, specific conditions for this call, as for example, uh, the one that uh, uh, Beatrice was talking about the land purchase uh, for SEF at least uh, that is not uh, eligible. But the system is 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 a global system for for EU uh, grants. So you will see uh, possibly fields that are not applicable to you. So. Um, I'll show you later in, in the slide, but keep this in mind because in some cases, when you open the, when you open the portal, you might see some categories that you think, ah, yes, it's allowed, but no, you look look at the call text, the sum are not allowed. Simply, on a, from an IT perspective, this couldn't have been disallowed by default. So, there are five cost categories on personnel, subcontracting, purchase, other costs, and in the cost. In 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 the uh, and typically cost category in their cost so category E and category D one financial support to the third parties are not applicable to this call. You will see it in the IT, but it's not applicable. Um, so the, the 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 detailed cost that you can uh, indeed uh, encode according to the call it's uh, on personal costs subcontracting purchase uh, uh, cost um, so uh, these are listed in the in the call um, document and there are some constraints like for example on project management cost uh, that should not exceed 10 percent system will allow you to do it but if you exceed uh, then we will have to cut it. So 
uh, keep in mind that it doesn't mean, as a general rule, it doesn't mean that what is allowed by the system is uh, by default uh, eligible or possible to be to be used in this call. Okay, uh, that how it will look like more or less. You have a table with several columns, and uh, the ones uh, that are uh, we are we have highlighted in the slide uh, those um, tricky one where actually they appear but you cannot use it. So the financial support for third parties, indirect cost. Um, it's uh, the, these two columns you should not use it. And the funding rates, you can actually manipulate it technically, technically but it should be fixed to uh, 50%. Um, so this next to the costs that are in the, uh, in the, in the port, or well, next to the, to, to, to the form that you have to fill in in code, in hard code, in the code, in the portal, you have this word, this, this Excel table. That is available for download in the portal, and uh, there you will have to indicate per work packages uh, cost. So, uh, indicate total cost per work package per applicant, so beneficiary, and uh, per reporting period. Then the 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 Excel calculates the total uh, automatically. And we can say that how it looks like basically there are, there are five sheets, and and please uh, do encode like sequentially, so starting from first to second, third, fourth, uh, and fifth uh, sheet. Uh, in that case, um, you will have some uh, data that are automatically populated as it goes. So if you follow that order, the the system sort of uh, works uh, properly. The fifth sheet is about uh, comparing what you have encoded in the in the portal and what you have encoded in the, in the Excel, and the two should, uh, should match. So, it is a sort of a validation sheet uh, that is important to verify at the end uh, what uh, what is um, whether whether the data are coherent. So basically, um, so points of attention: uh, total cost must uh, of match between the two, so between the cost categories and the work packages. Uh, since you have to encode the cost in the portal and in the Excel make sure that the two things are coherent uh, so and in case of uh, in case of uh, incoherences it is the you know, data that you have encoded in the portal that will prevail um, then uh, try to plan it as much as possible ahead uh, your accounting because then later on otherwise uh, you risk to have trouble in uh, in having this cost as accepted as as, as eligible that is always uh, our our contact, but that's uh, yeah quick uh, quick uh, main points on the, on the budget. Um, if you have already downloaded the, the form, uh, but uh, again I encourage you. I see some activities in the chat and also some replies, so let me know if there's anything to pick. Otherwise, otherwise I can uh, pass it to um, Christina right for the. Uh, so these are for so you will have some more slides uh, in the in the PowerPoint uh, when we will put it in uh, online, but these are basically the for you sort of um, memo to keep in mind uh, the the cost categories. But you have it also in the in the call text. So uh, Christina will guide you through the portal, and then Nadine through the grant agreement. So, um, good morning, everyone. Um, so, I will just uh, take the. Um, so, this is the portal um, that you probably already have seen. So, this is where all the uh, funding and tender from the European communities nowadays goes into. And this is uh, the page for our call. You have two different topics um, under this call, and there are two different pages. So for the works and, and then for the studies, you can easily switch in between. You can see here the deadlines. There's the, the topic description, but maybe most importantly, here you have links uh, for the call documents. And now you have um, an explanation of where to find different information on the call document. And you have links to all the templates. So the, um, 
advice is not to use these templates, but to use the templates that you will see on the portal, which uh, uh, submission portal, which I will show you right now. But as for the time being, we've had some technical difficulties. The submission is not open yet, so you will not have access to that. I think that will open later today. But also on this page, you have uh, FAQs already, so you can search by keywords and you have here a whole bunch that we have already prepared and we continue adding here. You have um, our email where you can ask questions, IT help desk uh, for anything linked to the portal and manual on how to deal with, with this portal. And we put updates here. So for example, the regulation publication was, was noted here on call updates. So then to go into that submission portal, which normally you should be able to access from here or which you can will be able to access from here when this opens start submission later today hopefully it'll look like this so um you come in here this is the studies and let's take the works just because there's a little bit more there so you can see the deadline dun, 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 dun. and here this is where you can upload um download the templates so it'll give you a zip file with uh, with all the templates in, in a format that can be easily filled in. Uh, this is the testing environment, so there's still the environmental template missing. So then what you do is um, if you're already, if your organization already has a PIC in the system, so um, identification number, um, then you just put it here. Or um, otherwise you can create an identity for your organization. And that is um, explained elsewhere. So here, for example, we um, you can search. Uh, oh, of course, not like this. This was by number. Okay, so we, we ended up there anyway. So these are our test. Uh, so you can uh, search uh, for your organization by name, or you can create a new identity for your organization. Then you just enter acronym for your proposal and here a short summary. So this will be the uh, the abstract of your proposal. So we would encourage you to put as, as much information as you can uh, here from early stages because this will help us in finding evaluators, for example, for your proposal. So uh, just to see a little bit what, uh, what kind of proposals are coming in general. So something. Um, here we agree that you uh, you agree that we can see your information. We can basically just see your um, who you are and 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 the uh, and the uh, uh, summary. So here we have and once you have the coordinator, you can add affiliated entities. You can add partners. You can add associated partners. We're not going to do that, but it's the same way as as we just did. Then we go into the main part of the of, of the proposal. So here, first of all, you have this edit forms, and that is the part A of your um, proposal, kind of the, the structured information. So you can see here, da, da, da. we start with the general information. <clears throat> your acronym is there, then you, you should try, uh, write the longer uh, proposal title, duration of the of the proposal, um, whatever. Uh, some keywords; those are also very useful to have. Um, later on, there will be some. There, there will be uh, in order for the structural reference to uh, to function. There will be some further development. So we will tell you when to go back in and correct uh, this thing. But this is a minor minor issue. One of the things why why the launching of this is is a little bit late. Then you have to click that you have uh, you have the consent of all applicants for their participation in this one. And then there are some other confirmations, but this is the obligatory one. Moving on, you have to fill in for the applicants some basic information. So um, let's say department name, unless it's not applicable, you put in 
phone numbers that would be very useful for us uh, so that if, if we have to at the uh, gap uh, face contact you uh, that'd be good to have um, all kinds of things um, then moving on to the budget that uh, Gianluca already mentioned so here you have this long um, kind of table for full budget and you can put in here you fill in things and as Jean-Luc said some of these fields you can fill in although they're not applicable to us so uh, pay attention to that uh, this is the works proposal so uh, you can see that for studies the funding rate is is zero so even if you put something in there it's going to be it's not going to be co-funded under this proposal um then it'll calculate your total eligible cost and then you should fill in uh, and by the funding rate 50 percent you put in um your required EU contribution, uh, requested EU contribution. Uh, Gianluca, you wanted to say something on the on the budget? No. Um, so you can keep working on this uh, proposal. You can save it, go back to it. So uh, so don't worry. You can kind of uh, fill it in little by little. So then there's some uh, other question: Is the proposal complementary to other proposal? Do you have synergies with sec with other sectors uh, with uh, Horizon? So if you have anything in here, do fill in. But this is not necessarily very. Uh, and and here it's uh, this will become part of your acronym for the for the project. So you would have to put in here where the project is being implemented. So let's say let's say Austria, for example, for now and. And um, yeah. then, um, so you can keep on saving the form, and you can check every once in a while on whether you have uh, on on the validation result. It'll show you when you have information missing. So yellow means that you can still continue working. Uh, it's 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 a uh, information missing, but it will not block you. If you have red blocks, uh, you will not uh, be able to submit the proposal if you have not filled those in. But pay attention to these yellow ones as well. They should all be filled in. Then you go back into your main proposal. And here, this is where you put the annexes. So part B is uh, the long proposal kind of in a word format. And you can see here that you should upload it in um, PDF format and you have maximum number of pages, 120 maximum number, file size 10 MB. And you upload it from here. Same in all of these, you can see what format. So the budget, I think, is the there's not uh, there's a couple of uh, slots that you can. Uh, the system requires uh, an Excel. Otherwise, it's usually always a PDF. Here we're also missing one annex, but the other thing to know about this is that when it's read like this, it means that it's a mandatory annex. So you have to put something in or the system will not let you submit. It might be mandatory anyway, but this is like, there might be some exceptions why uh, not everybody would need to put in something. But for these red ones, you need to put something, otherwise the system will not let you go further. Um, here again, you have the online manual IT help desk. So any problem about the IT elements of this application, please contact them. You have the FAQs once again. So once you have edited this, uh, put in the 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 the, the, um, the annexes. You can keep. You can print preview for your um, for your purposes. You can validate. Uh, it saves it. So um, as soon as you created it, you receive an email link to the proposal. So you can keep going back and working on the same proposal. It keeps there. But just as um, as Camila was saying make sure that you submit well before the deadline even if you submit with that link you can still go back and keep working on it so uh, just to be on a show side maybe even if you think that you might tweak it a little bit more in the last day or so 
submit it already so that it's already there and then whatever tweaks uh, you can still do. And that was it from my part. Thank you, Christina. Um, now, what's what I'm feeling about the budget is I can say this is the uh, question we received uh, for the day. Uh, so, we are really looking to see data regarding the action, not the CBS project, but budget that you encode in the system and the, in the Excel. It, it relates to the action that you. Propose and there was another question I think uh, also related to to the budget um, regarding uh, where, uh, whether to indicate uh, the any other funding that you are looking to 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 apply for to for, for your contribution uh, that you can indicate it in the Excel and even if they are not certain in the case they are not certain it will be important to tackle it via the especially the risk management part, because if there are uh, not yet decided, for example, formally, which can be the case, uh, it's important to understand how viable is the project without, uh, in the event that you, don't, you do not get this, uh, for example, national funding on your side. So uh, I would presume the risk management uh, section is the most, most appropriate, but uh, also work package uh, on, the, on the management can be also the right one, so up to you to to choose. Uh, I'm just looking at the questions. There's on already one. Um, in case the applicant is a new fund company, a joint venture, what kind of documentation is needed regarding financial capacity? And does the new company need to be established at the submission date? So if uh, easier, the second, the first one is complicated, but um, it needs to be established, yes. Otherwise, uh, if it has, doesn't have a legal, uh, if it is not a legal entity yet, uh, then uh, uh, it would not pass. I presume the the eligibility check. Um, maybe that's also something that Nadir you can come uh, into. And then uh, regarding the newly established uh, joint venture and the financial capacity, I presume there's some specific uh, procedure there. Um, do, do you? So, yeah, maybe just at the uh, at the application stage, you do not need to put anything for the financial uh, capacity. So that only comes later. So at the um, application stage, uh, the validation of the identity of the organization and the financial capacity um, assessment comes later in the process. So at the application, not yet. And for the newly, um, I don't remember the procedure. Quite, but I can I can find a link there. There's a special procedure for newly established companies, so there's nothing. Well, of course, newly established companies can also apply. It's just a different kind of uh, proof. I can. Yeah, the operational capacity is is checked during. Uh, uh, so this this is relevant as as for any for any organization, right? So maybe on more on this part on the financial capacity, we can uh, uh, come back to that with uh, with links and maybe put it in the queue. That could be useful. Yeah, any comments from colleagues? No. Okay. So then we can in the meantime move, but keep on uh, writing your questions. Very useful. And uh, the floor is yours to guide us through. Okay. And, uh, Model yes. So, good morning. My name is Nadine Kupitz. I work as a legal advisor in CINEA. And once your proposal has been um, successful and you are selected for funding, you will have to sign a grant agreement with CINEA, with, with us. What is the grant agreement? The grant agreement is a contract between um, uh, the agency, the granting authority, and uh, you as a beneficiary, which regulates your rights and your obligation. Your rights, and I want to like to stress that um, the model grant agreement, so a template is available on the funding 
port and tender portal, um, which was just shown to you earlier. And you can have a look already on this to familiarize yourself with the structure and the terms which are included. So the grant agreement regulates your rights, which is the right to receive the EU funding, to own the results, or to ask, for example, for amendments in case something happens when you uh, implement the pro your action and there are some changes needed. But it also says uh, it also regulates your obligations, which are, of course, the first one is to implement the project as planned in the description of the action. This is Annex 1 to the grant agreement. You are also obliged to submit reports to CINEA to keep us updated on the project implementation. And also, for example, there are some publicity um, requirements to display the EU emblem and reference to EU funding in case you publish something. Um, the grant agreement also um, says how much money you actually can receive from the agency, how much co-funding you will uh, receive. I would like to stress here that um, the amount mentioned in this grant agreement is the maximum amount. So there is no way, even not with an amendment, to increase this amount. But it could be the other way around. Imagine you, you cannot implement uh, uh, the action as planned or there are issues with the cost eligibility, you could also receive at the end less than um, what is indicated in the, in the grant agreement. Um, the CEF grant agreement follows the corporate model. That means that um, we, the, the grant agreement looks has the same structure, uh, no matter which fund. You can find it, as I said, on the attenders and uh, portal. And um, we follow the corporate structure. So um, that means that it's not basically not negoti negotiable. There are some um, options which can be um, applicable under a specific call, but the structure is always the same. We follow the e-grant. Uh, um, system that means that the everything is um, electronically from the CEF grant agreement, its management, amendment request, payment, everything is electronically. When you will have a look at the grant agreement, you will see that there are specific annexes as well. So pay attention, please, also to them and not just to the core text. And we would like to highlight you um, a couple of them, which are part of Annex 5. This is security, intellectual property rights, additional communication and dissemination activities, but also member state information and durability clauses. So please have a look um, at them. Next slide, please. There are different ways in how you can participate in the grant agreement. You could be, you have heard, I'm sure, in the presentations before that we are talking about beneficiaries, but there could be also affiliated entities, associate partners or subcontractors. And I just would like to give you a short overview what the difference is between those. What is a beneficiary is uh, highlighted in Article 7 of the grant agreement. And the beneficiary is the one who signs the grant agreement with the agency. There is the possibility that there are several beneficiaries in one action. And in this case, it is mandatory to designate a coordinator. Why? Because the coordinator has specific tasks, like, for example, the communication with the agency, um, so that we only have one to, um, to communicate to. I invite you to have a look at Article 7b. It tells you what is the coordinator and what are his roles and what can then not be delegated. His task cannot be delegated. The beneficiaries, which are not the coordinator, do not sign the grant agreement, but they need to sign an accession form, which is an annex, and it's available in the portal as well. And the signature needs to be done within 30 days after the entry into force of the agreement. We recommend you, the beneficiaries in principle have the same rights, but we recommend you to set up a consortium agreement. For ex It makes sense, for example, we pay only the coordinator and the coordinator shall then distribute the payments to the rest of the participants, to the other beneficiaries. But it is up to you to organize when, under which conditions. 
You could also participate as affiliated entity. That means that an affiliated entity must implement the action task attributed to them in Annex 1, and then they can also declare their cost directly under the same conditions as the beneficiaries. The affiliated entity must have a link with the beneficiary, and we mean by the link a legal or a capital link, not just for the action, but also in general, independent from the action. An affiliated entity must satisfy as well the eligibility criteria and of course should not fall in one of the exclusion criteria mentioned in the call. The important thing here is that the affiliated entity is responsible for their task but the beneficiary is the one who remains responsibility so over the affiliated entity so that they implement the task as foreseen. Next slide please. An associated partner um, has also to implement the action task uh, attributed to them. But the big difference between the associated partner and the affiliated entity is that associated partners do not charge costs to the actions and the costs for their task are not eligible and are therefore also not included in the budget table in Annex 2. The beneficiaries must ensure that the obligations listed in Article 9.1 apply to the associated partners. and. Associate partners may be linked to a beneficiary or to the consortium, but it's not a requirement uh, in contrary to what I explained before for the, for the affiliated entities where it is a requirement. And then we heard a lot already about subcontractors in the previous um, presentations. And um, we understand that you might need a subcontractor, so a contract, a third party, which implements certain tasks of the of the actions and um, the eligible cost what you would then declare is the the price you pay to the uh, to the subcontractor and we would like also to know what are subcontracting costs so the cost must be included in the estimated budget table and also when you declare the cost to us uh, marked as subcontracting costs so um, this is a specific slide for subcontracting where we want to highlight what is subcontracting because sometimes there are confusions. So subcontracts concern the implementation of actions like parts of the projects that you outsource. You want to build something, you want to install something, but you are not able to do that. Um, so you need a third party, a subcontractor, an out, an, another entity who does uh, this part uh, of the job for you. But please be aware that subcontracting may cover only a limited part of the action. So you cannot um, submit a proposal and you say it's not us um, who who carry out the action. We will give 100% will be done by a subcontractor. This is not allowed. Um, the beneficiaries have a contractual link with subcontractors with the object to buy something or to subcontract actions, as I said already, and the price for the subcontracts will be declared as subcontracting costs in the financial statement. Now comes the critical point. Um, when you use subcontractors, we will have a check on how you found the subcontractors and what was your way to subcontract uh, them. That means if you are subject to public procurement rules under national legislation and I want to stress that being subject to public procurement, national public procurement doesn't come from the grant agreement if you are or you are not independent from the action. You have to follow uh, national public procurement rules and we will also um, check this in case um, it is selected um, uh, for, for, for a check. If you are not uh, uh, subject to public uh, national public procurement rules, that means you're not a contracting authority or contracting entity, then you have to um, uh, fulfill the best value for money uh, uh, criteria, what uh, Camila already explained to you before. Next one, please. So I talked already um, about the different roles and about the role of the coordinator. And uh, remember, you you need a coordinator in case you have several beneficiaries in the 
um, in, the, in, in the action. You do not need a coordinator if you have one beneficiaries and, for example, two affiliated entities. You need a coordinator when there are several beneficiaries. And it is the coordinator who monitors that the action is implemented properly, and it is the coordinator that acts as the intermediary for all communications um, with the agency. So, for example, it's the coordinator that submits the pre-financing guarantees or requests and review any documents required and verify quality and completeness. And it's also the coordinator who distributes then the payment received to the other beneficiaries and um, it should be done without unjustified delay. Um, each beneficiary uh, is supposed to keep the information updated and stored in the portal in the participant register. Um, please keep your information there up to date and inform CINEA um, immediately in case there are some changes. Um, you, the rest of the beneficiaries uh, have to um, submit to the coordinator in good time the pre-financing guarantee, the financial statements, the CFS, the contribution to the deliverables and the technical reports, and any other documents and information required by CINEA. And of course, as I said it before, the communication is via the portal, all is electronically, so um, um, please keep your info there to date. When you look in the grant agreement, um, there are several um, arrangements for payments and it depends a bit how your um, uh, action will be structured. There is a possibility to receive pre-financing payments and pre-financing payment would be paid within 30 days upon the entry into force of the grant agreement. And in case um, there is, for example, a weak beneficiary, you would also require to, or a financially weak uh, uh, beneficiary, this entity would require to um, uh, submit a, a financial guarantee. But these are details you can, uh, will clarify, um, will be clarified in once you are in the grant agreement preparation stage. Interim payments um, can go up to a ceiling of 90% of the maximum grant amount. And also, when would you receive an interim pay payment? It also depends very much on the structure of your um, action and on the reporting period um, set in the grant agreement, uh, which is also done in, which is discussed with the agency when you prepare for the grant agreement. The payment of the balance calculation of the grant amount means that um, you would be reimbursed the remaining part of the eligible costs claimed for the implementation of the actions and the payment of the balance is paid usually within 90 days from receiving the periodic report. Um, I told already you, um, at the beginning of my presentation that you have uh, reporting requirements and um, I repeat myself a little bit here. The reporting periods um, depend on your on your action. Um, the action duration is divided into one or more reporting periods, which will serve as a basis um, for the reporting requirements. The language of the report is um, is English. Um, there is also continuous reporting, which means um, you have to report to the agency the progress of your actions. And this will also depend on the deliverables and the milestones set in your specific uh, grant. There are also periodic reports, which um, uh, needs to be submitted 60 days after the end of the reporting period. And then um, they have to include a technical and a financial part. And um, the financial statements uh, structure uh, can be also found on the portal. And you have to explain, and there might be that a CFS is uh, required, a certificate of financial statement. But this depends on your specific uh, grant, and you will know about this uh, once you have concluded it uh, with the agency. <coughs> The member states information in Annex 5 uh, means that you have to provide the reports to the member states that support the action, if this is applicable for you. So we have talked about, um, or there are some questions about amendments and what does amendment mean. So when you have 
the grant signed with us, you have uh, a description of the action, what you what you are supposed to do. Um, you have your milestones, you have your reports, but there's of course uh, possibilities that some Thing, something changes when you implement the action, which require an amendment. An amendment can be uh, requested by you, the beneficiaries. It could be in rare cases also requested from, from, from us, from, from, the, from the agency. But usually the most common is that you notice something during the project implementation and uh, that you uh, request the amendment then to the agencies. Um, so there is a specific part in the portal where you have to submit your request for amendment and it needs to be also signed in the portal and it must include the reasons why uh, you need this amendment. So please be clear why you need the amendment and you have to support um, these reasons also by, um, by documents that, that, that support, your, that support this, this amendment and that show us that it's really needed. Um, what is very important is that this amendment should never change the, the substantially the action. So give me, if you allow me a very basic um, uh, comparison, if you say, okay, I want to build, uh, I don't know, I don't know, you, you want to build a house, I mean, it's, uh, and suddenly you built uh, a port. Yeah, this is not the idea of this. We, you still, we will check with the amendments if you are still would still be eligible to the to the requirements of the call text. This is true for if you, for example, also see that it's necessary to add another entity. If you want to add an entity, we need to understand why, what for, what is this entity doing? But this entity needs also to fulfill the requirements of the call text. That means the eligibility requirements. We would also check for operational capacity, fin financial capacity, in case there's a major part going on of the actions to this entity. We simply need to understand why and we will check if it's really needed. An amendment enters into force on the day of the signature of the receiving party and an amendment takes effect on the date of the entry into force or other date specified in the amendment. Um, please be aware that the grant agreement may only be modified while it is in force and so before the payment of the balance. If a modification is required for exceptional reasons, for example, change of bank account, etc., after the completion date of the action and before the payment of the balance, such request must be duly justified by the beneficiary. Um, Article 17 of the Model Grant Agreement uh, talks about communication, dissemination and visibility. And the beneficiary must engage in the communication and in dissemination activities such as to present the project um, and also to upload the public project results to the CEF project results platform. Um, visibility, uh, we would like to tell <laughs> to the to the public that um, um, you have received uh, EU support for this. So please um, um, display the European flag and the funding statement uh, uh, in case you have publication documents or you build something, then it needs to be there. Um, there's also the possibility to suspend, terminate or reduce the grant amount. Um, this can come from both sides. The beneficiaries may suspend the action in exceptional circumstances uh, in case you are not able to implement the, the action anymore as foreseen and it's impossible to reach uh, any, any, any results. Um, there's an or you can also ask for termination of the action and we will also check what are the reasons for this. And this would go also via uh, amendment request over the platform. The agency, on the other hand, may suspend, terminate the grant agreement or reduce the grant amount in case we find substantial errors or ir irregularities or fraud. fraud sorry. 
Um, in case there is a serious breach of the obligation under the grant agreement or during its award, we would analyze what do we have to do. So is there a possibility for suspension that means you need more time or do we terminate because we know that you cannot, um, you cannot, you are not able anymore to implement the action. Um, if you have any problems when implementing the project and you are fearing that uh, you cannot implement the project as you planned, we please communicate to the colleagues and then we will have a look and we will um, we will analyze. But please be aware that it is a possibility in case we find substantial errors or irregularities that it could lead to the termination or, or the reduction of the grant amount um, for your action. Um, that was it. I saw quite some questions popping up in the chat. I don't know if my colleagues had the time to have a look on them. Yeah, well, uh, following the, the questions, they were not related, if I'm not mistaken, to the grant agreement part. I believe that you have also, we have received some questions beforehand that they were uh, linked to, to, to your part. I believe you have answered to Notably, there were quite a few questions regarding the roles uh, between uh, and responsibility, depending on uh, uh, whether you are a beneficiary or whether or you have a different status. So um, I'm just in, encourage uh, project if there are still un, uh, open or unclear points, you can also uh, put it in the chat or raise your hand. And questions, there were questions related to the changes in the CBRS project uh, from uh, from Nicole. Uh, Camilla, you uh, rep uh, replied, uh, there is, there is, we do have an FAQ there. Uh, and um, <clears throat> basically, yeah, any changes should be notified uh, to us uh, to, uh, regarding the wider project. Not, I'm not talking about the action about the receiving grant, but the wider CBRS project. So please notify us the changes and um, to be done always at least in the annual reporting and come to that in a moment um and uh this is yeah as you know will will uh, will assess so to say the change and then uh, uh, it's not going to be senior to take the decision it will be discussed with the commission and the mon member state group uh, monitoring the project um then if you are in the middle of your uh, yeah, preparation of the of the action so for example in this call and especially if you're working for 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 works uh, for submitting a works proposal then a uh, change is related to the project that might have an impact on the on your previous submitted cba that would be important to actually be and be notified and uh, send us an updated cba because of course if there is an impact on the uh, calculation of the CPA, notably the net present value of your project, then uh, this uh, uh, is important uh, to know. Losing the status, uh, the CBR status, it's sort of a last resort in a way. Uh, it is also um, regulated in the Delegated Act in Article 9. Uh, so there's nothing automatic in this. It's, it's a careful decision and uh, that is taken on, on a case by case, and it's taken together with the commission and the, and the, and the member states. Uh, it's more about changing the nature. But of course, if you have changes that affect, so to say, the reason why you were selected in the first place, so typically the CPA, it's, it was a really important uh, aspect of it. This needs to be notified and then will be assessed. I think to complement. Uh, the teacher, no? Yes, no. No, I, you know, that's correct. So, just to stress now, if you're in the middle of the preparation of the self application, uh, you will have really to justify very carefully uh, why, let's say, now the change of scope or the change of size. So, uh, this. So we need a proper justification, and uh, as Gianluca said, really all the necessary supporting documents um, to see whether, let's say, the activities that you intend to carry out uh, will still, let's say, correspond, or to which extent they correspond 
to uh, activities in implementation of the original CBS project and so to which extent they can be accepted. Thank you. Um, I'm just looking whether there are hands up or for the question in the chat. We are actually opening the, the Q and A. It was a lot of information, especially for those of you that are new to to self uh, to self application. So we gather that uh, digesting it, and eventually we will get also a new new question via email, and we'll build that uh, via FAQ, which are um, already published in the portal. So that's something I sent out as an information uh, yesterday, but stressing again. Uh, so the, we have seen while Christina was showing the portal, the list of FAQ, even though the portal is not yet open for the submission and will become open in a few, a few hours time. Um, but you have already a long list of FAQ that we have published uh, there. So, that may tackle any any extra doubt. Uh, the question we received today during the seminar will uh, we will process them and eventually populate even for the, the FAQ so that uh, there is accessibility also for people who are not who are not in this meeting today. Um, so that to let you know how, how things will uh, be followed up. And uh, as already said at the beginning, of the slides. As well as the recording will be available in our in our in the Cinea website, and we will notify you uh, whenever this is uh, uh, done. See no no hands up for the moment, and no chat. Getting towards lunchtime, so <laughs> attention goes uh, to us other side of uh, the body. Um, but I see a question from Gurley, so please, uh, you want to take the floor, open the mic? Yeah, um, when, when we take part on the call for studies and we make some uh, plannings uh, and so on, so we uh, will finish this planning uh, in, in, in one year and then we have to do a call for works, a second call. Is this right or is it uh, uh, linked with the call for studies? So when we finish the studies, we can go, we can get grants for the works. Or have we do a, a new call? Um. Okay, if I understand your question correctly, if you apply first for studies this year, then the question is, can I apply immediately for works next year? Um, well, this will be a little bit again your decision. Um, when you want to apply for uh, for studies and for works, one aspect I, I want to stress it again. Uh, is a little bit the maturity of the activities that you want to propose. Because um, let's say if you apply for studies now and when you apply for works uh, and you make the planning of your works and you, they will, let's say, if the preparatory activities uh, before you enter into works are already, let's say, quite advanced, that you can start, let's say, your works activities relatively soon, maybe in one year time or so, then we can consider you are mature enough to apply for works. Of course, there are other elements, but just as a little bit rule of thumb. But if you apply for works that there are still many pending, let's say, uh, decision making point on many uh, preparatory activities not finalized yet, that um, let's say prevent uh, us in the evaluation to say that you are mature for works, then uh, you have to consider perhaps to apply a bit later. So it depends really where you are with your project planning. And um, so you will have a bit to consider it uh, quite, uh, quite carefully. Uh, I hope I, Reply to your question. Anything? Um, yeah, uh, the, the question was when we got the grants for the studies, 
uh, we we have to do in the next step a new call for the works. It's not uh, when we get the the grants for the study that we will get the grants for the works uh, also. It's it's a new process for the works. Yes, yes. Every uh, it will be a new process. So next year, maybe the following year, or maybe in the next two years, I don't know. You will have to submit an application for works. If now you submit now or when you decide to submit application for studies, then you later on there will be another call, and you will apply when the call is open at the appropriate amount of time uh, among, uh, to the work. So it will be a new application. So now you don't need to have two applications. You, you concentrate first on the studies, if the idea is to apply for studies, and then let's say at a, proper, at a good moment in time, there will be a new application for works later on. So, so the, the grants for study is no guarantee uh, for grants for works? Absolutely not. And uh, as you have seen, the grants for works, uh, there are additional criteria that play a role. Uh, so the threshold to get the grant for works is higher because uh, for grants for works, you have to demonstrate the non-commercial viability of your project or part of your project and uh, uh, also the significant cost and benefit. But it's really the non-commercial viability and the presence of the funding gap that um, justifies the grant for works. So that's why it's a new, a different application. Okay, thanks. Okay. Any other questions on these or anything else? Anything we have touched upon today? Looking at chat, and it seems to be the case. Everyone's up. We can close it now. Last chance. <laughs> okay, we really hope it was useful for everyone. And uh, as I said, we will have follow up communication. Um, we will put everything online. And uh, as you know, it uh, don't hesitate to send us questions because we, we to reply as, as quick as possible and in a, as transparent uh, as possible. So using the FAQ, uh, as soon as um, the portal will be open, we also notify um, you. And then uh, otherwise, we just wish you very good luck. We are really looking forward to see high quality proposals. And uh, yes, don't hesitate then to get in touch and see you then uh, at the next occasion. And be sure to be in time. So keep in mind the deadline. As Christina was saying, better submit, even if you are not completely fully, fully ready, at least the application is there, you can always reopen and we submit a revised version before the deadline. After the deadline, uh, then it's, it's too late. Good luck with your proposals. Thank you, bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.